Good afternoon, Hotep. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Renoka Rashidi, and I have the good pleasure this afternoon of being at the um, Universal Charter School in Philadelphia. And we're recording a new video, DVD, which is entitled, Who is the Original Man? It's designed to look at every uh, geographic region in the world and to identify African people as the original people, as the aboriginal people of the planet. Now, a bit of background about myself. My name is Renoko Rashidi. That is an African name. Renoko is from Zimbabwe. Rashidi, of course, is from Tanzania. And I think that that name represents a kind of a pan-African character that I try to embody. Uh, I'm an anthropologist, a historian, and a world traveler. I've now had the good fortune to visit 70 different countries. And all of that is in search of the African presence. I look at the African presence at the, as the basis of humanity. Africa is the birthplace of humanity, number one. I look, number two, at Africa as the birthplace of civilization, high culture, um, agricultural science, metallurgy, <coughs> urbanization, um, scripts, writing systems. And then Africa as a continent that was invaded, um, subdued in many ways, Africa's children captured and dispersed through the world. But today is the beginning, and so we're going to focus right now on the African um, background to humanity. Now, to begin with, in Africa itself, you find the remains that you see on the screen before you of Dinknesh. Uh, Europeans call these bones Lucy. That means you are wonderful. And these bones were found in 1974 in the Afar region of Ethiopia. They are approximately 3.4 million years old. Uh, there are other sets of bones that have been found since these were located in places like South Africa, closer to 4 million years old, in Kenya, 4 million years old, but more recently in uh, Chad. And these bones are anywhere from 9 to 12 million years old. And these are not modern humans. They're called Australopithecines. And you have different species of Australopithecines. You have Australopithecus afarensis, for example. That, those are the remains of Dinknesh. And you have others. And then, of course, the Australop Australopithecines give way to another early um, human ancestor. And those are Homo um, habilis. And Homo habilis essentially means uh, handyman. Now, Homo habilis is different than, homo, than the Australopithecines in that not only do they walk upright on two feet and have large brains, but Homo habilis is able to make tools. They are able to manipulate nature. And then hundreds of thousands of years following the emergence of Homo habilis in Africa, you have another early species, and that is Homo erectus, or erect man. And erect man is also very, very important in the evolutionary scale, black, out of Africa, but Homo erectus is important because they domesticate fire, a basic, perhaps the most fundamental human technology. And then Homo erectus gives way, perhaps 500,000 years ago, to Homo sapiens. And the most famous regional variation of Homo sapiens is Neanderthal man. The most famous regional variations of Homo erectus is Peking man, or Beijing man, and Java man, found and dated in China about half a million years ago, and uh, in Indonesia about 250,000 years ago. And then finally, Homo sapiens gives way to Homo sapiens sapiens, or modern man. We call that species wise man. But we wanted to begin with this particular slide. And then we have the cover of a Newsweek magazine from the late 80s, early 90s, and it says, The Search for Adam and Eve. And the subtitle, Scientists Explore Controversial Theory About Man's Origins. This was controversial, particularly at that time. And this controversial theory, which is more fact than theory, was based on studies of DNA. Now, these DNA studies began in the middle 1980s with studies of what is called nuclear DNA polymorphisms. And that gave way to studies in the late 1980s of mitochondrial DNA, which can only be traced through the genes of women. And so here you have um, a magazine with a major article devoted to that. And this is supposed to be a depiction of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden um, with jerry curls, no less. I didn't know African people invented jerry curl, a jerry curl activator. But if Newsweek says so, it must be true, right? 
Anyway, this is a very interesting piece. The one thing that certainly would be different in addition to the hairstyle in reality is that they would have been much darker. I think that they are still in aversion to dark skin and tightly curled hair, what I call fair skin and good hair. And that means I'm looking at it from my perspective. I think Dr. Wade Nobles in San Francisco, uh, San Francisco State University likes to say something like, the essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and make them live according to that, to that reality. Let me re repeat. The essence of power is the ability to define someone's reality and make them live according to that definition as though it is a definition of their own choosing. And so other people have defined for us what it means to be beautiful. Imagine that. Our standards of beauty are defined by people who do not have our best interest at heart. Even things like what it means to be happy, what it means to be successful, all of these things are definitions that are imposed upon us from outside. And I think that this picture is a personification of that. And then you can see the snake curled around the tree. And then the next image we have takes us to the Nile Valley. Now this presentation, once again, is called Who is the Original Man? But there, um, as a prelude to it, I also want to introduce the concept of blackness uh, of, of ancient Egypt or the Nile Valley because African people before we get to the other parts of the world people the African continent as well and here you can find a photograph of the great pyramid of Khafre. Khafre is the son of Khufu and the pyramid of Khufu also called the Great Pyramid is the largest um, pyramid uh, in antiquity. It, there are about 118 pyramids in Egypt alone. Now we'll save most of this for a special presentation just on the Nile Valley itself. I want to do something special just on the royal dynasties of ancient Egypt, but I thought that we could kind of begin the major portion of our presentation with a look at these images right here. This one, again, is the Great Pyramid of Heru or Pharaoh Khafre in Dynasty IV, about 2575 BC almost 4,600 years ago. And in front of it is the monument that we call Horamakhet or the Great Sphinx, which has the body of a lion and the head of the king. It's 200 feet long and about 70 feet high. And this is also included in a presentation uh, that was done by the great filmmaker Bob Lott in Philadelphia, and it's called Renoko Live in Egypt. So this is just a brief uh, synopsis of that. And then we can see this modern falsification of history. This is the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas, and it really is a travesty. It doesn't even look right to me. But anyway, we move from this to this. Something's not right. But this is, I think, what most people imagine ancient Egypt looked like, or this is, would be a represent, representation of ancient Egypt. Now let's move on and just see these images from ancient Egypt. Now we know the ancient Egyptians were black people. They were African people. In fact, the name of the country is Kemet, which means the black city or the black community. But blackness also has a symbolic um, significance too. And in ancient Egypt, it would appear, based on the studies of art historians, that the color black represented divinity. That, in fact, the color black represented the color of God in ancient Africa. So let's look at a few of these. This, for example, is the great monarch Nepepet Ra Mentahotep II of Dynasty 11. This takes us to about 1995 BC, or before the Christian era, almost 4,000 years ago. And then this beautiful image of one of our favorite personalities from antiquity, antiquity just meaning ancient times. This is the great Amos Nefertari, wife and queen of Amos I. She is the co-founder of the 18th dynasty, which has been called the greatest royal family to ever mount a throne. And you, you can see here in this image, which is in uh, the Egyptian Museum in Berlin, this image of Nepepet Ra Mentotep II is actually in the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. This one takes us to Berlin. Now, one of the big topics that we have in our community today is the subject of reparations, and it should be much bigger. Now, reparations means different things to different people, but to Renoko, the historian, it also mean, and race man, it also means the restoration of our cultural heritage. That means we need to take an inventory of where our stuff is in order to get it back. This image is in Africa. It's in Luxor, Egypt. Luxor is my favorite part of Egypt. Luxor is important because this is where 80% of all the monuments in ancient Egypt are located. 
And this is an image of God, Amen, Amun, Aman, which means the invisible one, the unseen one, the hidden one. This is in my favorite museum in Africa, the Luxor Museum. And of course, this is the beautiful Queen Ty. This is the only image that I'm going to show in this sequence that is uh, one of the few images that is not symbolic. This is natural. This is real. This one is in that same museum in Berlin, the Egyptian Museum in Berlin. This is Queen Tai, or T-A. Um, some people pronounce it Queen T, T-I-Y-E. She is the mother of Agnaten and King Tut in a beautiful, natural blackness. This is an image of her most famous son, but the least important of her <laughs> offspring in all likelihood. This is Tutankhamun, or King Tut, and this is a black statue made of ebony, conveniently left out. You have to go to Egypt pretty much to see them. And then, of course, this image of an African queen from Dynasty 2021. Her name is Cairo Mama, and this image is in the Louvre, the National Museum in France. And you have two images here as we wind down <coughs> our brief segment on Egypt. This is um, a sister whose name escapes me, but this is another African queen from Egypt in Dynasty 2021. And you can see the remains of an African woman, not a mummy, but an African woman who has been mummified, the mummy unwrapped and photographed, particularly the hair, I think, draws our interest here. And you can compare this image from antiquity, 3,000 years ago, to this image of today. A black woman from the south of Egypt, more likely in the part of Egypt that we call Nubia. Nubia is a geographic uh, location in southern Egypt and northern Sudan. And finally, two more. This is the king uh, known as Taharqa. He's mentioned in the Old Testament, I think on three occasions. He led an army to Jerusalem to save his Jewish allies. He is king of Kemet and Cush, the dominant region to the south of Kemet or ancient Egypt. And here he is portrayed in all his black glory. You see the nose is knocked off, and we'll save that story for another presentation, the missing noses of African people. In fact, that might be the name of a future presentation, Africa's Missing Noses. And finally, this one of Jesus the Christ. This one is called Christ in Glory, painted black. As far as I know, this is the earliest known depiction of Jesus in existence. This is in the Coptic Museum in Cairo. You see an image of Jesus emerging from his tomb after the crucifixion. If you look very closely, you can see blood in his hands where he was nailed to the cross. Also on his feet, which are not uh, portrayed in this image. And you can see 11 of his disciples. The one pointing to Christ's side is St. Thomas, who we call Doubting Thomas. And here you can find Jesus with a natural hairstyle, an afro, and fair skin, black skin. So these things are important, and I wanted to just set the tone for the rest of the presentation by looking at these clearly black images, ethnic and symbolic from ancient Egypt. Now let's look at some of African people today and the various parts of Africa that they are found in. For example, if we go to Southern Africa, you can see different groups of people. Of course, if you go to Southern Africa, you can see the Koza, you can see the Zulu, uh, you can see the Indabeli, but there are much more ancient groups of people. Two of them in particular, one is called the Nama, and the other is called the San. These are the San, also called Bushmen. And these are very ancient people whose history in Southern Africa is perhaps 40,000 years old or more, probably older than that. I would suspect more like 100,000 years. In fact, they've recently found in Southern Africa, just within the last few weeks, evidence of the oldest ritual, the oldest religious ritual in the world. And they say it's 70 to 90,000 years old and it's depicted in Southern Africa among these people called the San. Now, 10 or 15 years ago, showing this image, I would have said that this, um, that they look like East Asians, like Chinese, like Koreans, etc. But now I would say that East Asians look like them. And these, and there's a good reason for that, because these folk like this are the original people of Africa and Asia, or at least very ancient people. And then we see something very similar with this San woman right here. And this is interesting because it shows that not all black people are dark. Some black people are naturally light-skinned. It has nothing to do with racial intermingling. Again, we're talking about the original man, the original woman, the original humanity, black coming out of Africa. And here is an adorable picture 
I think I got this photograph at an airport, I believe, in Johannesburg, South Africa. And again, folk like this represent the indigenous population of southern Africa itself. You can find populations like this in Botswana, in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, in Namibia, in Swaziland, and probably Lesotho as well. This image takes us to another part of the continent of Africa, and this image, of course, is from Mali. This is a beautiful young lady from Mali, and she, um, Mali is particularly important to us because this is, um, Mali has three ancient cities. You have a city called Gao, G-A-O. You have a city called Jine on the course of the Niger River. And one of the most important things as we study Africa is the river systems. If you understand Africa's rivers, you can understand African history. If you understand not just the history of the Nile, but the Niger, the Congo River, the Limpopo, um, the Zambezi, you will have the Orange River. You can have a good history of Africa. But the most important of those cities is called Timbuktu. And most of us have heard of Timbuktu. Timbuktu, uh, Mali is a large country. It has these three great cities. And of course, uh, this is an image of a black woman from Mali in Northwest Africa. So we've gone from Southern Africa to Northwest Africa. This image takes us to the Horn of Africa, a place called Djibouti. The Horn of Africa incorporates Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, uh, and Djibouti. Some people might also include Kenya in that category. So we've gone from south to west to east. This image takes us back northwest, and this is an image of African children in Morocco. And here's one of my favorites, fair-skinned daughters of Africa from the country called Senegal. Senegal also has a very rich history, and many of us probably came, or there's a likelihood that many of us came from there, or perhaps we came from Guinea, or Ghana, or Nigeria, all in that region in West Africa. Now, what I'd like to do now is to move directly from Africa itself and begin to examine uh, the African presence around the world. For example, this image right here takes us to Syria. And this image is um, in Western uh, Asia. And we're moving into a part of Asia that we sometimes call the Middle East although some of my Hebrew Israelite friends tend to call it Northeast Africa. This one is an image of a Syrian nobleman. This image is about 2,000 years old. This is in the National Museum, literally sitting on the floor in a corner in the National Museum in Damascus, Syria. And this image here takes us a bit farther, actually a little farther south than uh, Syria. These are Jews. Actually, these are captured prisoners of war. Judeans, this takes us to about 800 BC, and this image is in Israel. Actually, this is a series of bas-reliefs, uh, stone carvings, and this is in the uh, British Museum, the National Museum, uh, the prestigious National Museum of the UK, or certainly England, and this one is uh, Jewish prisoners of war. This image is of Ishmael. <coughs> Ishmael is a traditional ancestor of the Arabs, and Ishmael, as you can see here, is portrayed as Africoid or African, if you like. He is the son of Ibrahim uh, and an African woman, or Abraham, if you like, and an African woman named Hagar, a sister, a black woman from Egypt. And they are regarded, <coughs> certainly Ishmael is regarded, as the traditional ancestors of the Arabs. They laid the basis, he and his father, Ibrahim, or Abraham, considered a prophet in Islam, uh, laid the basis for the Kaaba sanctuary at Mecca. And in another presentation on the African presence in Asia, we will go into that in some detail. Here you have images of <clears throat> African people, black people, the original men and women of Western Asia. This, for example, is a sheik from Saudi Arabia. Here you have a beautiful image. This is one of my favorite slides. Unfortunately, I did not take this one. I can't claim credit for it, although I hope to visit the country that she's in. This is a black woman from Yemen in the southwest portion of the Arabian Peninsula. Yemen is closer to Africa than any other part of that region. In fact, it's just across the Red Sea, uh, the Bab el Mandeb from Somalia in Eritrea in Asia itself. And this 
region is particularly important because in ancient times, it was where the world's, we think, finest frankincense and myrrh came from. Frankincense and myrrh were very important in ancient times. They were used as a base for cosmetics, as an antidote to poisons. They were used in the mummification process. It is said that the, um, the Roman Emperor Nero used 50 tons of incense in a cremation ceremony. We know the story of the Christ child who was brought gifts of frankincense, <laughs> gold, and myrrh. Frankincense and myrrh being incense brought <coughs> to the Christ child in the manger in Bethlehem. At any rate, this made Yemen very wealthy, and it was also the domain of the Queen of Sheba, one of the most interesting and important uh, personalities in ancient times. And then we move here to Oman, and this is a new, uh, relatively new slide for me, a new image for me. Uh, Oman is at the base of the Persian Gulf. Um, I think that it's bounded by the Indian Ocean on the south, and then the Persian Gulf on the east. And this is a large, largely desert country. The capital is called Muscat, and this is a black man in Oman. I became interested in Oman about 25 years ago when I found out that African people were still being bought and sold as chattel slaves. This image takes us to Kuwait, and this is the former Crown Prince of Kuwait. For a while, he was the emir, only for about two weeks of Kuwait. He is a black man. He's a member of the Al Saba family in Kuwait. I don't know if he sees himself as black or African or Arab. Certainly, he probably personifies all of those things as well as being a Muslim by religion and way of life. This image, of course, takes us to Palestine, the Palestinian territories. Uh, this is a sister, a black woman from Palestine. She is also a former law student at Howard University. And since we're dealing with the Palestinian territories, we might as well have at least one image of a black woman in Israel itself. Now you have different black populations, different African populations in Israel. Some of them are quite recent. They come there as a result of the airlift from Ethiopia, taking the Beta Israel, also known as Falasha, out of Ethiopia into Israel. But you have other black populations that are probably the original people there. We know that the first culture of Palestine, Israel, is called the Shukba culture, S-H-U-K-B-A-H. This culture is at least 10,000 years old. We've examined the skeletal remains. They are clearly Africoid. So you have a very, very ancient African presence, too. And certainly in this region, you have populations like the Canaanites. You have the Phoenicians that have a black base. And then we go a little further east, and we look at the African presence in Iraq. Africans have been in Iraq for a very long time. You have an African civilization in Iraq called the Sumerian civilization. And then you also have Africans, again, who are captured in Africa, enslaved, and brought to that part of the world. They are particularly prominent in the southern part of Iraq near the city of Basra. And even now, I would say that the black or African population in Iraq is about 10 to 15 percent of the total population. Now, I call these black men and women, these Africans, the invisible people, because we seldom see them in the news, we seldom see them on TV, we seldom see them in the print media, but we have the evidence of anthropology and archaeology. You have eyewitness accounts, which means you have historical accounts. So we mesh these things together, these various scientific disciplines, in order to reconstruct the history of African people, because the reconstruction of the history of African people is essentially the reconstruction of the missing pages in world history. We are trying to look at uh, the role of people of color in general in history. We're specifically looking at the role of African people who I think are the most maligned, the most neglected people in human history. But we're also looking at the role of women. So that is not just his story. Women have also, in, in many ways, been written out of the history books. And we are trying to reconstruct a history that is not as Napoleon Bonaparte, the racist emperor in France, 200 years ago was wont to call it a fable agreed upon. Now this image takes us to South Asia. We're moving rapidly. We move from Africa itself into the Middle East, Northeast Africa, Southwest Asia, depending on the nomenclature that you uh, choose to use. I designate the area Southwest Asia for the most part. And now we're in South Asia proper. South Asia incorporates Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, 
Sri Lanka, and if you wanted to incorporate it, you could say Myanmar or Burma. And this is an Aboriginal woman from East India. She is from a group called the Banda, a very small group. In 1999, um, actually 98 as well, but 99 in particular, I attempted, um, I went to East, East India, a state called Orissa, and I tried to visit these people, but they are in a very isolated, desolate area. The French did some good anthropological work with these sisters and brothers in the late 1950s, and uh, they have become very, very familiar to many African Americans because they look like Africans on the continent of Africa. Some people I've even argued with, some people, have, for example, have told me that they were from Gabon. But most people would think that they are from Kenya or Tanzania. They are uh, from the area near Lake Turkana or perhaps even Maasai. A lot of that has to do with the bangles around this woman's neck. But I assure you that they are actually from East India. East India is very important to us from an African perspective, from an anthropological perspective, because India has the largest concentration of black people in any single country in the world. India has approximately three hundred million people of African descent. And in the course of this presentation, of course, I'm using the words African and black as synonyms interchangeably. Let's look at a few more. This is an image, a photograph that I took in uh, what's called a Basti, B-A-S-T-I. This is a black community outside on the outskirts of the city of Bhubaneswar in East India in the state of Orissa. If you want to know your geography, Orissa is going near um, the East Indian state of Bengal, also near the East Indian state of Assam and Sikkim as well. And again, this is what the original people look like. These are the first people of India. Humanity is born in Africa. And those Africans began to filter out of Africa, I think, maybe 150,000 years ago, perhaps earlier than that. And again, we know a lot of that based on studies of DNA. We know that the populations of Asia have African DNA, and they filtered into India, and they were the first people there. Before the first civilization was built, you have these black folk. Now, this image is Renoka Rashidi in the middle. I get in most of my slide presentations. Why should this be an exception? And here I am, the anthropologist. This image takes us to southwest India in the state of Kerala, outside the city of Cochin. This is deep in the rainforest. We had to drive the better part of a day to get there. Myself, my guide, <clears throat> three translators, and a security person to drive into the rainforest, into the jungles of southwest India to meet these black people here. They tend to be very small, very gracile, that is to say, small bone people. The average height is probably less than five feet tall. And of course, it was one of the most fascinating anthropological experiences I've ever had. Now this image takes us to another part of Asia and one of my favorite places in Asia and of course this black woman um, is from Cambodia and specifically she is called an Apsara. You spell that A-P-S-A-R-A -A. and she adorns the temple walls of the largest temple complex in mainland Southeast Asia, that temple complex being Angkor Wat. And this is what the images on the outside of the temple look like. Black women with what we would today call locks or braids, big beautiful lips made for kissing, and the nose is knocked off. And again, this is very similar to what we see in ancient Egypt. We'll have to do a presentation at some point um, that focuses on the missing noses of African people. This image also uh, is in Angkor Wat Temple, but instead of the outside walls, this is in the Holy of Holies. This is the innermost sanctuary of Angkor Wat Temple. And this is a bodhisattva. This is a person who has received or ha who has achieved a state of enlightenment similar to the Buddha himself. But a bodhisattva is different from a Buddha in the sense that the bodhisattva has chosen to remain among the world of men and women to help others achieve enlightenment. Achieve, achieve nirvana. And here you can see a coal black image with happy to be nappy hair and Africoid features. And this is how the deity is worshiped in Cambodia. I've actually, this is my actual photograph. You can go there and you can see Buddhist nuns and Buddhist monks prostrate themselves before this deity. 
This is one of my favorite images from Southeast Asia, if, the, if not the world itself. And this image is again in Cambodia, I would say perhaps 10 miles from the Angkor Wat Temple. This is the entrance to an ancient city in Cambodia built by a group of people called the Khmers who uh, adored their beautiful black skin, burnished bronze skin, they call it. The city is called Angkor Tom, not Uncle Tom, but Angkor Tom. And I took this photograph myself. I liked it so much that we use this to adorn the cover of my most recent book, which is called A 100,000 Year History of the African Presence in Asia. This is my first French language book. Now, and again, this is another really important image for me, Renoka Rashidi, personally. This is an image of the Buddha from Vietnam, and this one is in a special museum in France called the Musée Gamet. This museum is devoted to nothing but Asian artifacts. And this is an image of the Buddha, I think, from the 8th century AD. And I like this image so much that when I go to France and when I go to this museum, I actually come and speak to this image. When I see these images in the museums, it's as though I'm greeting old friends and family members of mine. Indeed, I think I'm an old soul too. But it gives me just tremendous pleasure and a sense of serenity to be in the presence of these images. Now, with these images, this next sequence, we look briefly at the original men and women of Southeast Asia. For example, this is an image of a black man from Vietnam. I've been in Vietnam twice. On my last trip to Vietnam, I took a group. I kept asking the guides, what about the black people of Vietnam? And the guides, I had four of them, kept saying, there are no black people in Vietnam. I said, OK, what about the Africans in the history of Vietnam? They said, there never been any Africans there. In the museum, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, formerly known as Saigon in Vietnam, we saw this particular image hanging on a wall. I took a photograph, which I was not supposed to take, but of course that didn't stop us. And um, I told the guy, the guy we were with in that part of Vietnam, which is the southern part of Vietnam, I said, these are the people that we're talking about. And he said, oh, that person is not black. That person was just in the sun too long. Or I would say something like that, and they would say, it's just a bad photograph. There's a shadow car over the photo, it's the Viet people are as racist in their worldview as anybody else. They are in what we might call in modern day America in denial about their own ethnic heritage. The black people in Vietnam, also known as Cham, were the ones who were there when the Viet came down from China a thousand years ago. This image is a fairly new image and this is provided to me by one of my students, a sister named uh, Miss Hamara Holt lives in New York City, in Harlem to be exact. This is an image of a black woman and her two children in Malaysia, and specifically northern Malaysia. I hope to visit Malaysia in 2007. And this is just across the border. These are images of a black woman and her child in southern Thailand. So these are the original people in that part of the world. And then this one, of course, takes us to the Philippines. And all of these black populations, short in stature, make up the original people in that part of the world, and they are slowly uh, disappearing. They're being absorbed into larger populations. It's interesting, too, that the last Miss Filipino, or Miss Philippines in the beauty pageant, was a black woman of short stature just like these. These people are commonly called Negritos or Eta. These are pejorative words. The word Negrito is a word introduced by the Spanish, which simply means little Negro. The word ETA is a Tagalog word. The Tagalog are the majority population of the Philippines today. It means filthy. We call them Octa, A-G-T-A, and that's what they call themselves. And the word basically means simply the people, as if they were the original people. They are very clear about who they are and what they are and what their history is in the Philippines. They don't see themselves as African. I don't even know if they see themselves as black, but the physical appearance speaks for themselves. Uh, or for itself, they live in places like Luzon, in Zambales, islands in the Philippines. Philippines, by the way, is named after uh, Philippine, uh, Philip II, King of Spain, because the Spanish are the first big European intruders into that part of the world, with Magellan in the 16th century. And also two uh, black youth in the Philippine islands. This is a relatively modern photograph. Now let us look at, go back to mainland Asia, and here you find from the Shang Dynasty in China an image of a tiger 
holding a black child. This is made of bronze. This is in the Chinucci Museum in Paris. This museum in Paris has nothing but Chinese artifacts. I have to give Europeans great credit for one thing, if nothing else. They stole a lot. You know, they are thieves par excellence. And it's amazing there are any artifacts left in the countries of origin. This is in the Chinucci Museum in Paris. This is called the Tigris. And it's an image of a tiger, bronze, Shang Dynasty, the first dynasty in China, holding, protecting a black child. You can look at the features there. They do not represent the features of the Han Chinese. This is um, from east of China. Of course, this is an image um, from Japan. This is an image of Fudo Mayo, F-U-Y, I'm sorry, F-U-D-O, Mayo, M-Y hyphen O. And the name means the immovable one. And Fudo Mayo is one of the five wisdom kings in Japanese mythology. He is patron deity of the samurai, the aristocracy of Japan. There are two proverbs that have been used to suggest an African presence in Japan, a black presence in Japan, used by no less than the great Dr. Shekant Diop. One of those proverbs is, to make a good samurai, you must have a bit of black blood. Another rendition of the proverb by a Swiss author, a book published called Race and History, 1926, and the proverb reads, to make a good samurai, half the blood in one's veins must be black. And we have some knowledge introduced by a European author named Alexander Francis Chamberlain, I think in 1911 or 1914, in a publication called the Journal of Race Development, uh, that shows or argues that the first shogun, a military general, military ruler of Japan, was a black man, Sakanoya Tamumararo. This is also from Japan. This is an image of the Buddha. Of course, the story is the Buddha got his tightly curled hair like that. In fact, some people would even tell you that that's not the Buddha's hair. Those naps, those kinks, those knots on his head that seem so obvious to many of us. I was told at a museum in Los Angeles that the reason the Buddha has hair like that is because it was very hot one day. He was sitting under the Bodhi tree, and to protect him from the sun, these snails crawled up on top of his head. Now, I'm the sort of person that doesn't take anything lightly. I went to India. I went to Bodh Gaya. I found the Bodhi tree. I sat under the Bodhi tree for the better part of the day. None of those snails crawled up on top of my head. Perhaps I'm not as uh, pious as the Buddha. But I wanted to test that theory. And even if there were snails on top of his head, I don't know what, how that would account for the black skin. Maybe he got sunburned being under the sun, but he also got a big nose. He got wide cheekbones, or what I think Dr. Robinson calls, um, I think he refers to majestic lips and, and, and nose or something like that. The great Dr. Edward Robinson that I've had the privilege to be with this afternoon in Philadelphia. Now this takes us to Europe. We're winding down now. We only have two regions to look at, uh, one being Europe. And I tend to lump Europe and Asia together because Europe is not a continent, contrary to what we were taught. Europe and Asia go hand in hand. We should refer to it as Eurasia. And Europe, the Europe part is a smaller portion. And of course, this is an image from ancient Rome of, of the second of three African popes. I believe that this is St. Miltiades. The first pope is St. Victor. The third pope is, uh, the second pope is Miltiades. And the third is St. Galatius. All of them were distinguished in one way or another. If we look at the history of the original man in Europe, we have African people moving out of Africa. They are transformed by the ice ages. They either perish or they are forced to acclimate. And so you have a person who loses their melanin content. Their skin grows much lighter because the sun literally goes out. The hair on their body grows longer and kind of cover them like a mat because of the intense cold. You have uh, the nose growing longer and thinner so that they're not breathing in that cold Arctic air that would freeze their lungs. So the original man in Europe either perished or went back to Africa or a warmer climatic area or adapted, mutated, if you will, and became the white man of today. There's only one race, and that's the human race, which is born in Africa, black skin, happy to be nappy hair. She, he, is the mother of us all. I say he, she, because we tend to, in the Western world, identify man as the originator. But we, in reality, we know that the female is the only one who we can trace that mitochondrial DNA from. This image, again, we're just looking at Egypt very briefly.
because what we know about the original man in Europe is through skeletal remains. But I wanted to show at least three or four images to show that not only was uh, the black man, the black woman, the original man and woman of Europe, but that they came back again and again and again. When we talk about the dark ages in Europe, we're really talking, we're hitting closer to home than most of us are prepared to acknowledge because the dark ages reflects a time when Africa, when the African star over Europe was in its ascendancy and Africans had not been reduced to servants and slaves. This is St. Maurice or Maris. This is an image of an African saint from Egypt, from the Thebaid area. He is a member of the Roman army. There's an uprising in Switzerland around 300 AD. The Roman emperor, I think Maximus or Max, uh, Maximian, sends an army to suppress this revolt. St. Maurice is the head of that army. It's called the Theban Legion. This is a historical fact. When Maurice ended up in Switzerland, he realized that the people he was supposed to suppress were themselves Christians. And he, being a Christian, decided, I cannot harm my fellow Christians. And so he was beheaded. His, uh, the Theban Legion was decimated, and he became identified as a saint. And important people in history, like Charlemagne, for example, revered this African saint. This is an image of St. Maurice placed in front of a, um, of a church in Magdeburg in eastern Germany in 1240 A.D. This one takes us to southern Europe, and these are the people called the Moors. The name Maurice means like a Moor, St. Maurice, like a Moor. But the original Moor, the word Moor means black. It means scorched. It comes from the Greeks and the Romans, and you have an image of Moors' heads on these flags, this one in particular, I'm not sure if it's from Sicily or Sardinia, but all the, uh, many of the flags of those island countries or those island regions in the Mediterranean reflect the Moors' presence. You can find one, for example, in Corsica, essentially identical to this. Corsica is where Napoleon came from. And this image is one of the black Madonnas. Uh, and we could do another presentation, too, uh, with Mr. Lott. And that presentation would be called um, the beauty of blackness. And this would, would just reflect images of black people, black saints, black deities in the ancient and modern world. This one is a black Madonna child from Switzerland. And of course, this is a black Madonna child from the Kremlin in Moscow in Russia. I actually took this photograph myself. And then you have a black man from the Caucasus Mountains. This is a black man from the Caucasus Mountains in what is now the country called Georgia. Not Atlanta, Georgia, but Georgia in Europe, Asia. And here you have a black man on the, uh, in the southern slopes of the Caucasus Mountains and the eastern shores of the Black Sea. So you could even argue that the original Caucasians were black people. This deals with the black presence down under, in the land down under. Of course, this is a black child with a wallaby in Australia. Sisters and brothers there are commonly called Aborigines or Aboriginal, which just means first. They told me they've been there for 120,000 years. They are the most spiritual people I've ever encountered. They tend to have naturally straight to wavy hair, in some cases blonde and red hair. And they have been almost decimated, almost wiped out by the Europeans who invaded Australia at the end of the 18th century. We'll show you three images, four images from Australia. Here's one. This is two. Everybody likes this one. Nice black and white photo uh, photograph. And another one who looks like my daughter. And finally, an image of a black boy in northern Australia. They call these saltwater people because they're proximity to the sea. And this young child, is in, this brother, is engaged in a rites of passage. These images take us to New Guinea. Looks like Theodore Pendergrass. And this is an image of a fair-skinned black woman from the Solomon Islands. Remember, I'm using these terms based on my perspective. Me being black, I would like to think of other black people as having fair skin. That's good skin. Fair meaning good. And then you have this image also from the Solomon Islands with this sister that looks like a Tina Turner look-alike. Another image of black uh, uh, women, black girls from the Solomon Islands with beautiful, natural Afro hairstyles. This one who looks a lot like Dick Gregory, also from the South Pacific. Here's an image of a black man from Fiji in the 19th century. This is a Fijian woman who looks a little like Jill Scott. Since I'm in Philadelphia, I can say those things. Another child from Fiji. Now, this is fairly rare. 
but it does happen. Black people with naturally blonde hair and blue eyes, unmixed. It may have something to do with the sunlight. It may have something to do with the combination <laughs> of the sunlight and the water that they're in a good portion of the time. All of these sisters and brothers from Fiji say they come from Africa, and they're quite proud of that. And finally, yours truly with a Fijian chief. I told him I came from Africa. He said, I want you to come to my village, live here, and learn his and teach history. It was a great honor, but of course, I had to decline. I did eventually come back. This one takes us to uh, Polynesia. In the Pacific Islands, you have Melanesia, you have Polynesia, you have Micronesia. Melanesia being the black islands, Polynesia being the many islands, and Micronesia being the small islands. And this is an image of a black uh, woman and her child from uh, New Zealand. She is from a group called the Maori. Here is the royal family of Hawaii. I think this is 1859. And this is King Kamehameha I, the most distinguished of all the Hawaiian monarchs. He is a person that united the Hawaiian Islands in the early part of the 19th century. He is a very large man, about seven foot tall, about 350 pounds. Finally, last chapter takes us to the Americas. This is an Olmec head, O-L-M-E-C. This is not what the people call themselves, but this is what they have been designated as by archaeologists. And the Olmec are important to us. They're like the Shang Dynasty in China because they represent the original um, civilization in the Western Hemisphere. More and more people are beginning to say that the Mayans um, coexisted with the Olmec. But anyway, what we know about the Olmec in Mexico, in the Gulf, uh, La, uh, San Lorenzo, Chesapotes, La Venta are the three most important archaeological sites. What we know most about them, or uh, the most outstanding characteristic, are these la large basalt heads. These large heads made of basalt stone one of which weighs 80,000 pounds. I believe there are 18 of these heads that have been excavated, and they all look like Africans. One of them was called Joe Lewis. Another, another one was nicknamed the Ethiopian. And of course, we are told that the reason they look like that by racist archaeologists is not because they were black, but because there was a big earthquake, and the heads flipped around and, and rolled around in the mud for a very long time and looked like black people. That's the source for another presentation. You also have, in addition to the massive stone heads, the terracottas. This is a terracotta that some people say looks like Lawrence Fishman, uh, Samuel L. Jackson, Renoko Rashidi, Bob Lott. Depending on what time of day it is and how you're feeling, you can pick one and they'll all look the same. I say it looks like Shaquille O'Neal. You be the judge. And then you have other terracottas like this one. Actually, I don't think this is a terracotta. I think this is a small uh, figurine. But the most interesting part for me is the shape of the head. And we can compare <laughs> that head with this one from the Congo. That is the baby, the child. And you can see certain things that represent a cultural uh, affinity or cultural similarity. And again, we're talking about the original people. And we know the original people of the Western Hemisphere were African people or African descendant people, just that, like they were everywhere else. You have this image from pre-Columbian America in Mexico of the black child, uh, kinky hair, brown skin. And I used my nephew, Donald Strong, in Los Angeles to compare. Finally, you have this image from uh, Belize. This is a bowl. It's classic Mayan. It's 500 AD. It's from the classic Maya period. It's 1,000 years before Columbus. It's in the National Museum in Belize. Um, and you can see there images of African soldiers in either leopard skin or jaguar skin going into battle with full suits of armor. This one is from Peru, and this represents a culture in Peru called the Moche or Mochica before the Inca. This is a black saint in Peru. This is Saint Martin de Porres, who may have uh, been born in Panama, but we find the greatest veneration of him in Peru, and he is the patron saint of the poor and downtrodden, which would make him particularly popular among African people in Peru, in Bolivia, in Ecuador, and other parts of South America. Most of the time, I think, when we think of South America and African people, we think only of Brazil. But in every country, you can find an African presence with the possible exception of Chile. And I'm sure if we dug far enough, we can find Africans there. We know that African people in the slums of Buenos Aires invented the dance called the tango. And finally, two more. You have this one of an African youth in Mexico 
eating a mango. Africans were brought into Spain as enslaved people. Of course, they were the original people. The last image for today, and who is the original man, who is the original woman, who is the original humanity, comes to us from Honduras. And the black people of Honduras represent different groups. They have one group called Creoles, but you have another group that represent a population that can trace its lineage to that part of Central America hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years ago. They're called Garigano, or Garifuna. They have their own cuisine, their own, their own religion. They have their own history. And they say they came to America before Columbus. We are the original people. African men, African women can lay claim to being the original um, lineage of humanity. That humanity is birthed in Africa, and if not for the migrations of these African people, sisters and brothers, the rest of the world would have remained devoid of human life and would in fact have been a human desert, and Africa would be the only populated continent in the world. So we have a history that is second to none. We have a story that is second to none. In fact, you might say we have the greatest story that has never been told. And we are in the process now of telling that story. African proverb says, until the lion has his historian, the hunter will always be a hero. And now we have our historians, and we intend to tell our story without apology. Thank you very much.